How long that wild rush lasted, I have no means of judging. It may have been an hour, a day, or many days, for I was throughout in a state of suspended animation, but presently my senses began to return, and with them a sensation of lessening speed, a grateful relief to a heavy pressure which had been held my life crushed in its grasp without destroying it completely. It was just that sort of sensation though more keen, which, drowsy in his bunker, a traveller feels when he is aware without special perception, harbour is reached and voyage comes to an end. But in my case, the slowing down was for a long time comparative. Yet, uh, Yet the sensation seemed to revive my scattered senses, and just as I was awakening to a lively sense of amazement, an incredible doubt of my own emotions and an eager desire to know what had happened. My strange conveyance oscillated once or twice, undulated lightly up and down like a woodpecker flying from tree to tree, and then grounded, bows first, rolled over several times, then steadied again, and coming at last to rest, the next minute the infernal rug opened, quivering along its borders its peculiar way, and hump humping up in the middle, shot me five feet into the air like a cat tossed from a schoolboy's blanket. As I turned over, I had a dim vision of a clear light like a shine of dawn, and solid ground sloping away below me. Upon that that slope was ranged a crowd of squatting people, and a staid-looking individual with his back turned turned stood nearer by. Afterwards, I found he was lecturing all those sitters on the ethics of gravity and the inherent properties of falling bodies. At the moment, I only knew he was directly in my line as I descended, and him round the waist I seized, giddy with the light and fresh air, waltzed him down the slope with the force of my impetus, and, tripping at the bottom, rolled over and over recklessly with him sheer into the arms of the gaping crowd below. Over and over we went into the thickest mass of bodies, making a way through the people until at last we came to a stop in a perfect mound of writhing forms and waving legs and arms. When we had done, the mass distangled itself, and I was able to raise my head from the shoulders of someone on whom I had fallen, lifting him or her which was it, into a sitting posture alongside me at the same time, while the others rose about us like wheat stalks after a storm, and edging edge shyly off as well might they might. Such a sleek, slim youth it was who sat up facing me, with a flush of gentle surprise on his face, and, a dap- and dapper hands that felt cautiously about his anatomy for injured places. He looked so quaintly rueful, yet withal so good-tempered, that I could not help bursting into laughter in spite of my own amazement. Then he laughed too, a sedate musical chuckle, and said something incomprehensible, pointing at the same time to a cut upon my finger that was bleeding a little. I shook my head, meaning meaning thereby that it was nothing, but the stranger with graceful solitude took my hand and, after examining the hurt, deliberately tore a strip of cloth from a bright yellow toga-like garment he was wearing and bound the place up with a woman's tenderness. Meanwhile, as he ministered, there was time to look about me. Where was I? It was not the Broadway. It was not Staten Island on the Saturday afternoon. The night was just over, and the sun was on the point of rising. Yet it was still shadowy all about, the air being marvelously tepid and pleasant to the senses. Quaint, soft aromas, like the breath of a new world, the fragrance of an unknown of unknown flowers, and the dewy scent of never-trodden fields drifted into my nostrils, and to my ears came a sound of laughter scarcely more human than the murmur of wind in the trees, and a pretty undulating whisper as though a great concourse of people were talking softly in their sleep. I gazed about, scarcely knowing how much of my senses or surroundings were real and how much fanciful, until I presently became aware the rosy twilight was broadening into day, and under the increase, increasing shine a strange scene was fashioning itself. At first it was an opal sea I looked on of mist, shot along its upper surface with the rosy gold and pinks of dawn. Then, as that soft, translucent lake ebbed, jutting hills came through it, black and crimson, and as they seemed to mount into the air, other lower hills showed through the veil with 
rounded forest knobs till at last the brightening day dispelled the mist, and as the rosy-colored gauzy fragments went slowly floating away, a wonderfully fair country lay at my feet, with a broad sea glimmering in many arms and bays in the distance beyond. It was all dim and unreal at first, the mountains shadowy, the ocean unreal, the flowery fields between it and me vacant and shadowy. Yet were they vacant? As my eyes cleared and a day brightened still more, I turned my head this way and that. It presently dawned upon me all the meadow coppices and terraces northwards of where I lay, all that blue and spacious ground I had thought to be bare and vacant, were alive with a teeming city of booze and tents. Now I came to look more closely. There was a whole town upon the slope, built as might be in a night of boughs and branches, still unwithered, the streets and ways of that city in the shadows thronged with expectant people moving in groups and shifting to and fro in lively streams, chatting at the stalls and clustering round the tent doors in soft, gauzy, partially colored crowds in a way both fascinating and perplexing. I stared about me like a child at its first pantomime, dimly understanding all I saw was a novel, but more allured to the color and life of the picture than the concern with its exact meaning. And while I stared and turned my finger, and while I stared and turned, my finger was bandaged, and my new friend had been lisping away to me without getting anything in turn but a shake of the head. This made him thoughtful and there, thereon followed a curious instance which I cannot explain. I doubt even whether you will believe it. But what am I to do in that case? You have already accepted the episode of my coming, or you would have shut the covers before arriving at this page of my modest narrative, and this emboldens me. I may strengthen my claim on your credulity by pointing out the extraordinary marvels which science is teaching you even, to our, even on our own little world. To quote a single instance, if anyone had declared ten years ago that it would be shortly be practicable and easy for two persons to converse from shore to shore across the Atlantic without any intervening medium, he would have been laughed at as possibly amusing but certainly extravagant romancer. Yet that picturesque lie of yesterday is amongst the accomplishments, accomplished facts of today. Therefore, I am encouraged to ask your indulgence in the name of your previous errors, for the following and any other instance in which I may appear to trifle with strict veracity. There is no such thing as the impossible in our universe. When my friendly companion found I could not understand him, he looked serious for a minute or two, then shortened his brilliant yellow togo, toga as though he had arrived at some resolve and knelt down directly in front of me. He took my face between his hands and, putting his nose within an inch of mine, stared into my eyes with all his might. At first I was inclined to laugh, but before long the most curious sensation took hold of me. They commenced with a thrill which passed up all my body, and next all feeling save the consciousness of the loud beating of my heart ceased. Then it seemed that my boy's eyes were inside my head, and not outside, while along with them an intangible something pervaded my brain. The sensation at first was like the application of either to the skin, a cool, numbing emotion. It was followed by a curious tingling feeling, as some dormant cells in my mind answered to the thought transfer, and were filled and fertilized. My other brain cells most distinctly felt the vitalizing of their companions, and for about a minute I experienced extreme nausea and a headache such as comes from overstudy though both pass swiftly off. I presume that in the future we shall ha all obtain knowledge in this way. The professors of a latter day will perhaps keep shops for the sale of miscellaneous information, and we shall drop in and be inflated with learning, just as the bicyclist gets his tire pumped up, or the motor motorist is recharged with electricity at so much per unit. Examinations will then be Come matters of capacity in the real meaning of that word, and we shall be tempted to invest our pocket money by advertisements of a cheap line in astrology. Try our double strength two minute course in, of classics. This is the remnant day for the tri 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 trigonometry and metaphysics, and so on. My friend did not get as far as that. With him, the process did not take more than a minute, but it was startling in its results and reduced me to an extraordinary state of hypnotic receptibility. When it was over, my instructor tapped, tapped with a finger on my lips, uttering aloud as he did so the words, No none, no some, no little, no more. 
Again and again, the strangest part of it all is that as he spoke, I did not know at first a little, then more, and still more, by swift accumulation of his speech and meaning. In fact, when presently he suddenly laid a hand over my eyes and then let go of my head with a pleasantly put question as to how I felt, I had no difficulty whatsoever in answering him in his own tongue and rose from the ground as one gets from a hairdresser's chair, with a vague idea of looking round for my hat and offering him his fee. "'My word, sir,' I said in a lisping Martian, as I pulled down my cuffs and put my cravat straight. "'That was a quick process. I once heard of a man who learnt a language in the moments he gave each day to having his books blacked, boots blacked, but this beats all. I trust I was a docile pupil? Pupil?' Oh, fairly, sir, answered the soft musical voice of the strange being by me. But your head is thick and your brain tough. I could have taught another in half the time. Curious enough, was my response. These are almost the very words with which my dear old tutor dismissed me the morning I left college. Never mind, the thing is done. Shall I pay you anything? I do not understand. Any honorarium, then? Some people understand one word and not the other. But the boy only shook his head in answer. Strangely enough, I was not greatly surprised all this time, either at the novelty of my whereabouts or at the hypnotic instruction in my new language just received. Perhaps it was because my head was still spun too giddily with that flight in the old rug for much thought. Perhaps because I did not yet fully realize the thing that had happened. But, en but anyhow, there is the fact which, like so many others in my narrative, must at last remain unexplained for the moment. The rug, by the way, had completely disappeared, my friend comforting me on this score, however, by saying he had seen it rolled up and taken away by one he knew. We are a very tidy people here, stranger, he said, and everything found lying about goes back to the palace storerooms. You will laugh to see the lumber there, for few of us ever take the trouble to reclaim our property. Heaven knows I was in no laughing mood when I saw that enchanted web again. When I saw I had lain and watched the brightening scene for a time, I got up, and having stretched and shaken my clothes in some sort of order, we strolled down the hill and joined the light-hearted crowds that twinned across the plain and through the streets of their city of booths. They were the prettiest, daintiest folk ever eyes looked upon, well-formed, and like us as could be could be in the main, but slender and willowy, so dainty and light, both men and women, so pretty of cheek and hair, so mild of aspect, I felt, as I strode amongst them, that I could have plucked them like flowers and bound them up in bunches with my belt. And yet, somehow, I liked them from the first minute, such happy, careless, light-hearted race, again, I say, never was seen before. There was not a stain of thought or care on a single one of those white foreheads that eddied round me under their peaked, blossom-like capes. The perpetual smile their faces wore never suffered rebuke anywhere. Their very mu mo movements were graceful and slow. Their laughter was low and musical. There was an odor of friendly, slothful happiness about them that made me admire whether I would or no. Unfortunately, I was not able to live on laughter, as they appeared to be, so presently turned to my acquaintance, who told me his name was the plain monosyllab monosyllabic Anne. Anne, clapping my hand on his shoulder as he stood, lost in sleepy reflection, said in a good, hearty way, Hello, friend, yellow jerkin. If a stranger might set himself athwart a ch the cheerful current of your meditations, may such a one as... Ask how far tis the nearest wine shop or, or a booth where a thirsty man may get a mug of ale or a moderate reckoning. That gilded youth staggered under my friendly blow, as though the hammer of Thor himself had suddenly lit upon his shoulders, and ruefully rubbed his tender skin. He turned on me mild, handsome eyes, answering after a moment, during which his native mildness struggled with the pain I had unwittingly given him. If your thirst be as emph emphatic as your greeting, fr friend Heavy Fist, it will certainly be a kindly deed to lead you to the drinking place. My shoulder tingers with your good fellowship, he added, keeping two arms length clear of me. Uh, do you wish, he said, merely to cleanse a dusty throat or for a blue or pink oblivion?
Why, I answered laughingly, I have come a longest journey since yesterday night, a journey out of count of all reasonable mileage. I might fairly plead a dusty throat in his excuse for a beginning, but as to the other thing mentioned, those, those tinted forgetfulnesses, I do not even know what you mean. Unfortunately, you are a stranger, said the friendly youth, eyeing me from top to toe with renewed wonder, and by your unknown garb, one from afar. From how far no man can say, not even I, but from very far in truth. Let me stay, stay your curiosity for a time, and now to bench an ale mug, on good fellow, the shortest way I was never so thirsty as this since our water butts went overboard when I was sailed in the southern seas as a tramp apprentice, and for three days we had to damp our black tongues with the bottles the night dews left in the lift of our mainsail. Without more words, being a little odd of me, I thought, the boy led me through the good-humoured crowd to where, facing the main road to the town, but a little sheltered by a thicket of trees covered with gigantic pink blossoms, stood a drinking place, a cluster of tables set round an open grass plot. Here he brought me a platter of some light, inefficient cakes, which merely served to make hunger more self-conscious and some fine ar aromatic wine contained in a triple-bodied flask, each division containing vintage of a separate hue. We broke our biscuits, sipped that mysterious wine, and talked of many things until at last something set us on the subject of astronomy. A study I found my dapper gallant had some knowledge of, which was not to be wondered at seeing he dwelt under skies each night set thick above his curly head with tawny planets and glittering constellations sprinkled through the space like flowers in May meadows. He knew what worlds went round the sun, larger or lesser, and seeing this I began to question him, for I was uneasy in my innermost mind, and, you will remember, so far had no certain knowledge of where I was, only a dim, restless suspicion that I had come beyond the ken of all men's knowledge. Therefore, sweeping clear the board with my sleeve and breaking the wafer cake I was eating, I set down one central piece for the sun and, and see here, I said, good fellow, this morsel shall stand for that sun you have just been welcoming back with quaint ritual. Now stretch your starry knowledge to the utmost and put down the tankyard for a moment. If this be yonder sun and this lesser crumb be the outermost one of our revolving system, and this the next within, and this the next, and so on, now if this be so, tell me which of these fragment fragmentary orbs is ours, which of all these crumbs from the hand of the primordial would be that we stand upon. And I waited with anxiety a light manner thinly hid, to hear his answer. It came at once, laughing as though the question were too trivial and more to humor my wayward fancy than aught else. The boy circled his rosy thumb about a minute and brought it down on the planet Mars. I stared and stared at him. Then all of a sudden, then all of a terrible cry, tremble cried, you trifle with me. Choose again. There. See, I will set the symbol and name them to you anew. There now, on your soul, tell me truly, which is this planet is? The one here at our feet? And again the boy shook his head, wondering at my eagerness, and pointed to Mars, saying gently as he did, so the, certain, the fact was certain as the day above us. Nothing was marvelous but my questioning. Mars! Oh, dreadful, tremulous, unexpected! With a cry of affright, and bringing my fist down on the table till all the cups upon it leapt, I told him he lied! lied like a simpleton whose astronomy was as rotten as his wit, smote the table and scowled at him for a spell, then turned away and let my chin fall upon my breast and my hands upon my lap. And yet, and yet, it might be so. Everything about me was new and strange. The crisp, thin air I breathed was new. The lukewarm sunshine new. The sleek, long, ivory faces of the people new. Yesterday, was it yesterday? I was back there, away in a world that that pines to know of other worlds, and one fantastic wish of mine, backed by a hideous infernal chance, had swung back the doors of space and shot me, if the boy spoke true, into the outer void where never living man had been before. All my wits about me, all the horrible bathos of my earthly clothing, clothing on me, all my terrestrial hungers in my veins. I sprang to my feet and swept my hands across my eyes. Was that a dream or this? No, no, both were too real. The hum of my 
faraway city still rang in my ears, a swift vision of the girl I had loved, of the men I had hated, of the things I had hoped for, rose before me, still dazzling my inner eye, and these about me were real people too. It was real earth, real skies, trees, and rocks. Had the infernal gods indeed heard? I asked myself, the foolish wish that started from my lips in a moment of fierce discontent and swept me into another sphere, another existence? I looked at the boy as though he could answer that question, but there was nothing in his face but a vacuous wonder. I clapped my hands together and beat my breast. It was true. My soul within me said it was true. The boy had not lied. The the jinns had heard. I was just in the... flesh I had, my common human hunger still unsatisfied, where never mortal man had hungered before, and scarcely knowing whether I had feared or not, whether to laugh or cry, but with all wonder and terror of that great remove sweeping suddenly upon me, I staggered back to my seat and dropped my arms upon the table, leant my head heavily upon, upon them, and strove to choke back the passion which beset me.